I'm Soraya Wintersmith. Tonight on Greater Boston, investigators find neglect is to blame for the death of a patient at Shattuck Hospital in Jamaica Plain. We'll hear from the patient's sister, as well as GBH Deputy Investigations Editor Jennifer McKim. Then, the U.S. Surgeon General is warning of a loneliness epidemic in this country, calling it as dangerous as smoking several cigarettes every day. Haywood Earl was just 60 years old when he died of skin cancer at Shattuck Hospital in Jamaica Plain back in 2020. Three years earlier, he had seen a hospital dermatologist about a mole on his nose, which she suspected was cancerous, but didn't order a biopsy. Ultimately, the dermatologist recommended surgery to remove what had become a tumor on his nose, but that wouldn't happen for another 11 months at a different hospital. By then, the cancer had spread. Earl died around a year, a year later and just three years after he had first entered Shattuck Hospital psychiatric unit. Earl's avoidable death and the series of missteps by the hospital were the focus of an investigation from the nonprofit Disability Law Center, which found that Earl had a high chance of survival at the time of his initial visit, but instead the hospital's failure to provide appropriate medical treatment constituted neglect and contributed to his painful, untimely death. Earl's case is just one instance of ongoing issues at the Shattuck, first reported by the GBH News Center for Investigative Reporting. I'm joined now by the journalist behind that report, GBH News Deputy Investigative Editor Jennifer McKim and Haywood Earl's sister, Beverly Goodridge. Jennifer, Ms. Goodridge, thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome. I want to start with you and just ask, who was your brother and how did he come to be in the care at the Shattuck Hospital? Haywood, he initially um, became under the care of the Shattuck uh, around 2017 when he was transferred from Solomon Collar Fuller to my objection. And once he was inpatient at the Shattuck, everything basically went downhill. Um, he would reach a point of baseline stabilization and then if the doctor, the psychiatrist he was under, felt he needed a change of medication, it had to go under the court, um, they had to approve it. Sometimes it would take months before the doctor would literally get those changes and hey, what will go downhill again. Then he would start to become more, more and more um, psychotic and the, the wheel just started over again. So he was there for three years, um, and I, during that time, I had to basically fight for everything for him. F even from the point of the initial doctor he was under, um, the administrative people pulled him from under her care and put him under another doctor's care that was not really invested in Haywood getting better. Mm -hmm. He went downhill then, and that's when a lesion started to pop up on his nose. Mm -hmm. They had monthly team meetings. Nothing was uh, vocalized to me about the lesion until he, I had to literally fight to get him to be put under another psychiatrist. So during that time span that Haywood was at the Shattuck, he literally had three psychiatrists. Mm. Jennifer, I'm so proud to be your colleague, number one. You quoted one person's characterization of this case as incredibly shocking, given that Mr. Earl was in the hospital and supposed to be receiving care. What can you tell us about the Disability Law Center's findings, and what did the officials involved in the case have to say for their care of him? So the Disability Law Center um, started this investigation after Beverly asked for it, because she, as she told me in the story we had run, um, that she just felt like something had gone wrong. She didn't understand why he would die, why her beloved brother would die um, from skin cancer. So she went to the Disability Law Center. They looked into it and they got an expert to, to look at his case and they said she, she he would have survived if he had gotten some timely treatment. And so that was the thing. And she said what Tatum Pritchard, who I quoted, said it was so shocking because there he was in a hospital, in a locked facility, in a psych psychiatric ward, and yet nobody in the place got him help or told Beverly what was going on for, for over a year before um, he got help. 
And so what did the officials involved in the case have to say, both the doctor in this specific case and then your reporting, you talked to state officials also? Right. So as part of the Disability Law Center investigation, they went to the state and the state uh, basically acknowledged that there were there were problems with what happened. They would not admit, as the Disability Law Center asserted, that there was racism or bias because of his mental illness, but they did say that there were problems. And so, and they told me that it was a tragic death. Uh, the doctor also, who's a dermatologist at the facility, she's been working there for a very long time. I got her on the telephone and she said she had never been told about this investigation and that she didn't believe she had done anything wrong. Ms. Goodridge, I heard the story and thought that cases like these play into people's skepticism about medical institutions. Did you lose any faith that you might have had before your brother's death in the ability for hospitals or other medical institutions to care for people? Well, I initially didn't have any faith in the state um, care, psychiatric care for Haywood. Haywood received the majority of the psychiatric care from Beth Israel for over 20 years. And there was a point where the medical people at Beth Israel felt he was just too much and let's put him under what they call the Rogers Act when you become um, under the state ward. And that's what happened. So in me having faith in medical care, I have faith in medical care that is quality, that cares for its patients. Uh, it's very sad that you're in a public health facility, and the name of that facility is Limerick Shattuck. Mr. Shattuck, his vision was for quality public health care for the public. So it's so ironic that the Shattuck Hospital is at the point that it is now when money was given by this man's estate, Mr. Shattuck, who had a vision for public health, quality public health. Jennifer, to Ms. Goodbridge's point, this isn't the first time that you've looked into criticism of care for really vulnerable patients at the Shattuck. Yeah, exactly. So uh, this is uh, one of the state hospitals that cares for the, the, some of the state's poorest patients, including mm -hmm. prisoners, uh, the unhoused, and people with mental illnesses like mm -hmm. Beverly's brother. So. Um, and there have been problems over years. We investigated this because we had heard about a doctor, an orthopedic surgeon, who had been sued 20 times by prisoners for allegations of um, medical malpractice and other issues. And that was when we, I started looking at this case uh, of the Shattuck Hospital in Jamaica Plain and heard from many people, both activists, uh, prisoners activists, uh, others, as well as former doctors who have spoken on the show about their concern that, this, that the, the hospital has problems with oversight and has put patients at risk. A number of systemic issues to report about. Ms. Goodbridge, I wonder, are you looking into any legal action given the Disability Law Center's conclusions about your brother's case? I'm glad that you asked the question. I have already looked into it. Um, I'll say in 2000 and Haywood passed August of 2020, I immediately looked into um, legal counsel and I was told that basically it wasn't worth uh, them to look into it because of the uh, bureaucracy of that state institution and what they would have to put out, it wouldn't be worth it for them. One law firm did go to the point where they obtained um, an out-of-state oncologist and that from my understanding that oncologist said that um, it's not worth it, the bureaucracy is too, too much to even deal with. And you still feel this way post-report? No, I don't actually. I've learned that there's actually um, a, a gentleman, a young man from the DLC, the Department of Correction, who was seen by that same uh, dermatologist who supposedly evaluated my brother, and that parent is suing that particular doctor. So I had no idea that my brother was seen by a dermatologist at the Shattuck. That's something that I learned from your reporting Right, as well. exactly. That was her big frustration mm -hmm. that no one told her. And it wasn't, she was there every week visiting mm -hmm. her brother and meeting with the team every month. And no one told her for months and months that her brother had been seen by a dermatologist and there was concern about cancer. Another thing that I found interesting in reading your reporting, 
they don't use or require board certified physicians to work with patients. Why is that? Yes, so that was another issue that came with our first investigation that this orthopedic surgeon who had um, has is a focus of these lawsuits also is not board certified in orthopedic surgery. Um, as And this doctor, this dermatologist also, I spoke to her, she said she's board qualified but not board certified. The state says, Listen, we, we would like everybody to be board certified, but it doesn't, if not having it, it doesn't mean you can't be a doctor and that there's issues with work shortages and hiring that they haven't been able to do it. I've spoken to other people in other hospitals who say they would not have doctors work in their mm -hmm. facilities without certification. So it is an issue. Ms. Goodridge, I'll let you have the final word here. Just quickly, what would you want people to know, folks who are looking to fix the situation so that it doesn't happen again? What would you want them to know? When Haywood was alive, um, like Jennifer said, I visited him every week. They had team meetings monthly. I literally went to every team meeting. I would pick him up on the weekends, take him on passes, go to get a haircut, the community barber. Sometimes the barber would come up there to shave him, to cut his hair. I got to meet a lot of those patients. In the summertime, they would be outside having their smoke, doing their walk. They would run up to me, you're Haywood's sister? I wish I had someone to look after me like Haywood has someone to look after him. So what I would like to happen, those people some of them are gone now. I would talk to different people. Where's so-and-so? Where's, oh, he's gone. They're, he's passed away. Many of those patients there passed away before Haywood passed away. Did they have anyone in their family who know, knew that they passed away or even knew or know that they're in the Shattuck Hospital? Mm. Ms. Goodridge, Jennifer McKim, thank you so much for being with us. Thank Welcome. you. Next up, the U.S. Surgeon General is warning of a dangerous health risk that as many as half of Americans are affected by at any given moment. It's not a new virus, bacteria, or any other kind of infectious disease. It's what he's calling the epidemic of loneliness. And in a new report, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy warns that levels of social isolation are growing in this country, with Americans now spending close to an hour a day or more by themselves than they did back in 2003 and 20 minutes fewer socializing with other people. And if we fail to address the crisis, Dr. Murthy writes, we will pay an ever-increasing price in the form of our individual and collective health and well-being. He goes on to say, instead of coming together to take on the great challenges before us, we will further retreat to our corners, angry, sick, and alone. To discuss, I'm joined by Jill Setti, a psychologist who now writes for Greater Good magazine, and Dr. Eugene Beresin, a professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and the executive director of the Clay Center for Young Healthy Minds. Dr. Seti, Dr. Bereson, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having thank you. me. Uh, this is an interesting conversation, I think, because when we think about the things that we need in order to have good health, we're not necessarily thinking about mental health or what fulfilling social connection does for our mental health. And, and so, um, Dr. Seti, I wanna start with you. It's a feeling officials say is difficult to quantify loneliness, and I think that's partly because it's a difficult thing to identify if you don't have like language or introspection for it. So for the benefit of folks watching at home, how do you define loneliness? Well, loneliness isn't the same as being alone necessarily. It's actually a disconnect between what kinds of social connection you want in your life and what you actually have. So that could mean not having as many connections, but it can also mean just not having sufficient connection with other people so that you feel supported, safe, and as if you belong in a community. And Dr. Baresson, it has implications for our physical health too. What are some of the ways that we see loneliness manifest in our bodies? Well, in adults, um, it has about a 30% increase in heart disease about a 30% increase in um, stroke, uh, about a 60% increase in premature death. Uh, and it, and in, in younger people, it can cause inflammation uh, and the problems with the immune system. Uh, that's not, that's, those are the medical aspects of, of loneliness and there's certainly uh, psychiatric or mental health challenges as well. Do you wanna say some more about those? Sure, I mean, um, a loneliness, uh, 
cause sufficient, especially in young people. And it so happens that the most, the largest segment of the population that is lonely are the millennials and Gen Zs. And Gen Z is actually the largest. And one would not expect that because it's it has typically been the elderly. But uh, but there were reports by Cigna and by the BBC back in 2019, 18 and 1920, and in and, and 2020, that showed that the Gen Zs had the largest proportion of loneliness. And it was related to a trend that the Surgeon General reported about a crisis in mental, youth mental health uh, back in 2021 that showed that anxiety, depression, uh, and suicidal uh, behavior were escalating uh, at, at, at uh, alarming rates. Hmm. Ms. Seti, I'll go back to you. It's a private pain that we're bringing into public view with this discussion of this report from the Surgeon General, but it's not the easiest thing to come out and say to others, hey, I'm looking for some more meaningful connection. It makes you vulnerable. Um, people get afraid that they might look needy. I wonder how you might encourage folks once they recognize that they're struggling with loneliness, how do you advise that they start fixing it? Well, despite the fact that it may feel really vulnerable to admit that you're lonely, I mean, as you just heard from Jean, um, a lot of people are experiencing it. So you aren't alone in being lonely. And, um, you know, it's even become worse because of the pandemic and how much we had to isolate from other people. So, um, I mean, one way to think about it is that way is just to have a little bit of compassion for yourself. It's pretty uh, normal experience for people. Uh, the you know, and of course, it's okay to be lonely occasionally, but what you don't really want to do is make it a chronic thing. So reaching out to friends and family, I mean, one thing that might help is that if you look at the research, people often appreciate it more than you think they will. They actually like to be reached out to. So, um, you know, c contacting with people who are already close to you in some way, family or friends can help. But you can also just go out in public settings where you might run into other people uh, and have smaller interactions that maybe aren't so consequential, but they will also help with loneliness because it's not just about the very close relationships, it's just feeling part of a greater whole or community that can help stave off loneliness. And, and of course, vulnerability, oh, I was just gonna say, and of course, vulnerability also uh, often is a glue in social relationships. So even though you think, oh, I'll look needy, it's actually a way of making people feel like you trust them and care about them enough to be vulnerable with them. And you wrote a piece for your publication that identifies some other suggestions that people should take up when they're feeling lonely. Were you inspired to write that piece because you found yourself suffering? That's a good question. But, you know, honestly, uh, I don't suffer a lot from chronic loneliness. I'm very fortunate that way. But I've been steeped in this research for 17 years now. I've been, uh, you know, writing about uh, social connection and the, and the things you can do to increase social connection. And I also had an opportunity to interview Vivek Murthy a few years ago. So um, some of it came from stuff I'd researched in the past, um, and some of it came from my more recent work, uh, talking with him and looking at the research. But um, yeah, there were several things. Certainly, I use these strategies myself when I am feeling a little bit lonely, so not to say I'm never lonely. I want to play a clip for both of you of one young lady who declared her private pain in a way that resonated with thousands of people. Take a look. This is probably the loneliest I've ever felt in my life. I just want like a girl gang. I just want like a group of girls to be friends with. I don't know. There's just something so lonely about your mid twenties. I have people in my life. I do. But, I don't know, it's just like a lot of weekends by myself, which is fine. <laughs> I just don't like anyone. <laughs> I don't trust anyone. 
Dr. Barres and Ms. Seti, once I got past my own emotions in watching that, I thought about the fact that the Surgeon General, like you mentioned in his advisory, indicated that loneliness is most pronounced among teenagers and young adults. Yes. I think it was ages 15 to 24, who apparently have less contact with their friends, but use a lot of social media to find community. So I'm curious, for both of you, with respect to social media, are you looking at it as a tool for further connection, like to alleviate loneliness? Are you seeing it as something that ultimately gets in the way of more deep and meaningful connections? It, the sword cuts both ways. I think during the pandemic, um, uh, social media was fundamentally important. Um, many of my patients and the, the young teenagers and young adults used digital media to connect with each other. And despite the fact that it can be used for harm, cyberbullying, one in three, um, uh, um, the, the images that we've had on Instagram that have kind of made people feel terrible about, especially young, young uh, mm -hmm. women about their bodies. So social media can be used for better or for worse. Um, it's interesting, in the BBC study where they examined uh, um, younger people, uh, teenagers and young adults, uh, so everybody, everybody kind of assumed that social media was the culprit. They found that the the folks who were lonely versus those who were not reporting loneliness used just as much social media. So I think we've got to we've got to see social media as a possible ally. It can be extraordinarily valuable, for example, for shy, anxious kids, for kids who are on the autistic spectrum, high functioning ones that really need to connect around certain activities, groups can be meeting socially. And during the pandemic, it was it was a godsend. Now, that being said, um, I think we're all digital hostages and there's excessive use and misuse of social media. Um, and, it, and, and the fear of missing out and staying up way too late and getting sleep deprivation and having blue screens at night certainly don't help. So I think my advice to younger people and to their parents and grandparents is that we all need to kind of be more media literate and understand uh, the uses and misuses of, of the apps that are on our phones and the amount of time we're spending there. And, and you can't beat face-to-face -face time. So in, in most cases, put the phone down and, and just have conversations is, is the best advice. Jill Seti, are you also viewing social media as a potential ally to help with this crisis? Uh, yes, I couldn't have said it better. Uh, that's exactly what I would say is that social media cuts both ways. It can be an asset, especially for teens or young people or anyone really who's in a group that they don't feel they live in a community that's supportive of them, maybe for their political beliefs, social sexual orientation or whatever, um, it could, you know, social media can be a way of feeling like you have a community outside of where you live that you can connect with, who can understand you and offer support um, and that sense of belonging that's so important. Um, so yeah, it, it can be really helpful, but that said, there are the dangers of bullying and social comparison, thinking everybody else looks like they're so happy mm. online. You know, they look like they're having the time of their lives. What's wrong with me? And you might turn it on yourself and assume that there's something wrong with you instead of recognizing that, you know, social media isn't about necessarily opening up and being vulnerable. Um, that's why it's important if you can to have, you know, in-person contact and more uh, places where you can be yourself. So uh, uh, also, of course, during the pandemic, it's all we had in a lot of cases. So it was better than nothing. Um, but uh, now that now that we're able to get out again, it's really great to be able to see people in person. I'm sure I, I'm not alone in um, having that feeling of relief of being able to walk the streets and run into neighbors and talk to people in shops and see my friends in person and give them a hug. Because of course, physical touch is also so great for feeling connected to other people. And we couldn't do that much during the pandemic, so. It's certainly been wonderful being out of quarantine. Very quickly yeah. from one or both of you, at what point would you recommend someone reach out to a professional for help sorting through their loneliness? 
Uh, well, I can begin. Um, if, if if the uh, loneliness is coupled in particular with, with either anxiety or depression or suicidal ideation, um, if one feels so miserable that they can't function daily, I mean, the, the, the CDC's data on um, um, adolescent anxiety, depression, and suicide, which has uh, skyrocketed over the since between 2011 and 2021, and the Surgeon General's previous report was on the um, uh, the crisis of youth mental health. Those kids that can't function normally, that have trouble getting to school, that can't think clearly, um, who actually become clinically depressed or anxious, really should get um, a, a psychological or psychiatric evaluation, as well as their family, because there's lots of things that are going on in the lives of kids and young adults. And I think that that getting some uh, professional opinion is extremely helpful. All right, we'll have to leave it there. We're out of time. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Baresin, do you, Jill Sadi, do you have something that you really, really, really need to add quickly? Well, you know, I just wrote about a study about depression and anxiety where they asked people to, one group to practice um, random acts of kindness to anybody in their life, strangers, friends, anything, a couple of days a week um, for five weeks. And it had as much effect on depressive and anxious symptoms as doing cognitive behavioral therapy, which is kind of the standard of care. Yeah. Uh, and it also increased social connection. That's what I wanted to get at, is that being kind, um, practicing acts of kindness towards others can take you out of that feeling of you know, focusing on your own loneliness and sometimes increase social connection. So. An important and reminder so, to be so kind. There, Thank you so much. There's one more thing. The one. There's one more thing that I'd like to add, um, and that is, is that very quickly, very quickly. Yeah, our our young people are overscheduled and under the pressure cooker and not collaborative and not working collectively. They're com and and because in in order. To the pressures for academics and playing musical instruments and being on sport teams. They're working 24 seven and they don't have time actually to hang out. They don't have time because they're so pressured. So I think one of the things that, that Dr. Murphy and others have, have suggested is that we really need to look at how we're structuring the time uh, in the United States in particular around overscheduling and overburdening our kids and derailing them and in and actually fostering loneliness because they don't have they even if they had you know even if they had the desire they they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to do it because they'd be they'd be under the pressure cooker to achieve another excellent point we have to leave it there Jill study dr. Barres and thank you so much thank, thank you. you for having us that's it for tonight thanks for watching I'm Soraya Wintersmith Good night. on Antiques Road.